We are in the series we're calling Up, In, Out. Looking at up, examining God in, in worship and prayer, in both in terms of individual spiritual formation and being community, and then out, looking out beyond ourselves. You might want to reread Luke 6, 12 to 19, which is an example in Jesus' life of up, in, and out. This week, we're looking at a couple of aspects of in. In, in terms of spiritual formation and transformation, you know, what God is doing in us so that we reflect more and more of the life of Jesus. And in, in terms of life within the body of Christ. It's always been easier to focus on self. And it's even easier to do that in this time of COVID-19 when we, we build in physical distancing. Dan White uh, wrote, Discipleship to Jesus requires participation in a community that presents a radical commitment to the way of cross-like love. You see, community is more than some idealistic vision of everyone loving one another because everyone is the same. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his classic book on community, Life Together, points us away from human idealism and towards the reality of the community Jesus has actually made. It's not our place to make community. It's our place to see and recognize and live in and nurture the community that Jesus has made us to be. And part of what that means is that we shouldn't be idealistic about community, which often leads to an attitude of condensation for the the people we're stuck with, with a get on with and get on rather with loving the community that God has put us in. Discipleship, apart from relationship, apart from community, is not really discipleship. And I believe Western uh, North American evangelicalism is experiencing a crisis of discipleship and gospel witness because its perception of spiritual maturity is measured in almost exclusively individualistic terms. The Bible, however, describes spirituality and growth most often in corporate terms. Again, let me go back to Dietrich Bonhoeffer and life together. Let him who cannot be alone beware of community. Let him who's not in community beware of being alone. Each by itself has profound perils and pitfalls. One who wants fellowship without solitude plunges into the void of words and feelings. And the one who seeks solitude without fellowship perishes in the abyss of vanity, self-infatuation, and despair. We're created for community. You go back to Genesis and the first days of creation. It says God, God says it was good. And then on the final day, it is all very good. It's not until we get to Genesis 2.18 that we find the first thing that's not good. The Lord God said it's not good for the man to be alone. We are designed, created for relationship, for community. Elizabeth O'Connor, in her, in her book, Journey Inward, Journey Outward, writes, Only a visible community where one can experience the breaking down of the dividing walls within oneself will make witness to a God who calls us out of estrangement and isolation. Do you see what she's saying here? Ah, there's a clear focus on God who calls us out of estrangement and isolation. In, there's a, there's a breaking down of the dividing walls within oneself that works within a visible community. And out, so that we become a witness to God in this world that's full of estrangement and isolation. You see, being with God in, in worship and prayer changes us, transforms us from the inside out so that others are drawn to God. On Sunday morning, I told the BBC story of uh, interviewing Desmond Tutu and his mother. Uh, They were walking down the street when Desmond was about nine. In the days of apartheid in South Africa, when a black person and a white person met while walking on a footpath, the black person was expected to step into the gutter to allow the white person to pass and to nod their head as a gesture of respect. But this day, before a young Tutu and his mother could step off the sidewalk, the white man stepped off the sidewalk. And as they passed, he tipped his hat in a gesture of respect to her. It was a moment that changed Tutu's life. When his mother told him it was Trevor Huddleston, an Anglican priest, who was bitterly opposed to apartheid, who had stepped off the sidewalk because he was a man of God, Tutu knew he wanted to be an Anglican priest, and he wanted to be a man of God. Huddleston would would later become a mentor to Desmond Tutu and his commitment to the equality of all human beings due to the creation in God's image was a key driver in Tutu's opposition to apartheid. My prayer today is that we all be people of God who are willing to step off the sidewalk and, and tip our hat to our brothers and our sisters 
especially those who are on the margins. Do you greet people when you're out? Do you say hi? Do you nod your head? Do you raise your hand in greeting? Do you wear your mask when you're in a public building? Do you keep physical distance? Are you gentle with cashiers who are working hard to, to keep surfaces clean and work with people who are sometimes pretty uptight? Can I be blunt? That's Humanity 101. It's so basic. Treat other people with gentleness, with kindness, with respect. If we are not doing that, they will never have the right or the privilege of sharing Jesus with others. N.T. Wright, in his book, After You Believe, reminds us that our lives are to change when we, would be, when we begin to follow Jesus. There are some practices, some things that are to shape us as followers of Jesus. And we're looking at some of those things this fall. And it's just as in sports or music, we practice. It's the same with, with spiritual practices. There are things we do that enable us to be strong in tough times. Listen to what Wright says in, in After You Believe. The revolutionary vision of virtue enables us to shift attention quite drastically away from the idea that Christian behavior in the world is basically about good works in the sense of good moral living and keeping the rules and so on, and toward the idea that Christian behavior is basically about good works in the sense of doing things which bring God's wisdom and glory to birth in the world. What God calls us to and how God calls us to live is, is to live out the reality of the good news of the kingdom of God. I wrote in a, a Facebook post last week that there are three missional challenges that the modern evangelical church needs to come to grips with. We need to resist the extreme individualism and, and narcissism of Western culture. And that's becoming more and more evident in this political realm, and, and sadly, in too many Christians. It's all about me and, and what I want, which is the total opposite of the gospel. Secondly, we need to tell a compelling, up-to-date and beyond story about the living God and the communities that serve him in the name of Jesus and where things are going. And then thirdly, to live out in public the radical and quite possibly uncomfortable consequences of that. You see, if the gospel doesn't change us, we haven't received the gospel. We're just making up our own stuff. To live in is to be transformed from the inside out. Or to put it a, a, another way, to be in the process of being transformed from the inside out. Robert Mulholland, in his excellent little book, Invitation to a Journey, describes spiritual formation as the process of being conformed to the image of Christ for the sake of others. You see, this thing we call Christianity is not pray a prayer and you're good to go. It's not follow this program and bingo, you're mature. No, it's about the process. It's not something that takes place instantaneously, but we grow, we mature, we produce fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We are changed. All of us are in the process of spiritual formation. We're being shaped into either the wholeness of the image of Christ or a horribly destructive caricature of that image. Destructive not only to ourselves, but also to others, for we inflict our brokenness upon them. The direction of our spiritual growth infuses all that we do with imitation of either life or death. You see, it's the process of being conformed. Spiritual formation recognizes that apart from being in relationship with God, we are broken people. And so the process of being conformed to the image of Christ starts and takes place at the points of our unlikeness to Christ. Being conformed will mean moving against the values of our self-focused North American culture and be transformed by Jesus. It's the process of being conformed to the image of Christ. Scripture bears witness to the fact that only God can ultimately set us free from bondage and heal our brokenness and cleanse us from uncleanliness and bring life out of deadness. Spiritual formation is the experience of being shaped by God toward wholeness. And as long as we try to fill our yearning with things other than God and fill our lives with activities other than God's purposes, we will be unfulfilled and incomplete. Our cross is the point of our unlikeness to the image of Christ, where we must die to self in order to be raised by God into wholeness of life in the image of Christ right there at that point. 
This process of being conformed to the image of Christ is for the sake of others. Wholeness is, is demonstrated, it's lived out, it's, it's actualized. And you know, Pick your own word for that. In, in nurturing one another towards wholeness, both within the community of disciples of Jesus and in our role as God's people in announcing and proclaiming and healing brokenness and injustice in the world. Self, spiritual formation is not self-centered. Spiritual life is more than a private matter between me and God. There, there's no wholeness, no being conformed to the image of Christ, which is not made real in our relationships with others, both in the body of Christ and in the world. If you want a simple litmus, litmus test of your spiritual growth, examine the nature and the quality of your relationships with others. We, have been, we looked at uh, Acts chapter 2. And I want you to notice in particular Acts uh, 2, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Those are all relational activities. They is a key word. They is all those who responded. They is all those who are being transformed. They is all those who called themselves followers of Jesus. Let me quote Elizabeth Connor again, this time from her book, Servant Leaders, Servant Structures. She says, holding to the narrow way, as life promising as it may be, has never been easy and is especially difficult in our market-driven industrial countries with their emphasis on consumption and private gain. Very few today talk about or value solitude, creativity, friendship, dialogue, reflection, political and social action on behalf of oppressed persons. A different way of being in the world but all those possibilities for our lives would be nurtured in small groups. This is a remarkably wearying time we're living in. We really do need one another. And if we're going to influence and speak hope to a generation that's marked by recession and the attention economy and identity fluidity and, and post-Christian thinking and a global pandemic, we're going to need it by being a people that are ongoingly being transformed who are reflecting the ways of Jesus and that takes community.